Let's look in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Lord willing, I'll get through this tonight. My allergies are killing me up here. So, Proverbs chapter 28. I want to share a message entitled Great Glory. Great Glory. In Matthew, <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 28, verse 12. When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Happy is the man that feareth, uh, feareth of what alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight. It's a joy to be able to sing these songs of praise to our God. And certainly, Lord, it's a blessing to be able to have the Bible in front of us. And so, Lord, speak to us tonight about this great glory that we can experience and, and know in a personal way uh, as we walk with our God and we trust in our Savior. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you'll be glorified through everything that will be said Certainly we would pray that if there's anyone that's not sure they're saved, uh, that they would come to know Christ their Savior tonight. And so bless the preaching, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 12. It says, When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. And when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Great glory. It's interesting here. He says, When a righteous men do rejoice. And so... We need to understand that word righteous. Righteous is a word just simply means to be just or to be lawful. It's as in a sim very simplistic way is just doing what's right. Righteousness. You know this word righteousness is used 188 times in the Old Testament. And it's used 225 times in the New Testament. And so it certainly speaks to us that if a right when righteous men do rejoice, uh, there is a there is a great burden, I should say, a great blessing that is placed on those of us that are willing to walk in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we have no righteousness in ourselves, but Jesus took all our sin upon Him and gave to us his righteousness so that we can live a righteous life. Why? Because when a man is righteous, when a man is doing what is right according to what God has so declared what is right, then men will rejoice. And so that's the next word we have to consider. Uh, it says when righteous men do rejoice. Uh, the word rejoice there means to exalt or to be glad. Now, I'll take one of the songs we've sung tonight. They were, uh, all of them were speaking about rejoicing and being happy in the Lord. They were blessed songs, amen? And so uh, this matter of exaltation or happiness uh, because of the fact of what we experience in our relationship with the Lord. And so if we are going to be righteous, it is a common reality that there will be rejoicing. And that rejoicing will be abundant uh, and we'll be able to experience much as far as the presence of God in our life. This word rejoice is used 142 times in the Old Testament. The very first time that this word is used in the Old Testament is in Leviticus chapter 23 in verse 40. And I put that up on the screen for you. It says, And ye shall take um, you shall take you on the first day the boughs of the goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of the thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And it's just, it's amazing to see that during this time, he's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, that the children of Israel were to observe that feast with the acknowledgement as righteous men, they're rejoicing in their God. And uh, Matthew Henry said this, the institution of the Feast of Tabernacles was uh, one of the three great feasts at which all males were bound to attend. 
and celebrated with more expressions of joy than any other. And so if the Bible expect, uh, speaks to the fact that men are to rejoice before their God the first time that, that word rejoice is used in the scriptures, then certainly it would behoove us to learn a lesson that God wants us to come into his presence rejoicing. He wants us to be glad. He wants us to be happy. Matthew Henry goes on to say, they were to rejoice before the Lord during all the time of this feast. God's former mercies to us and our fathers ought to be kept in everlasting remembrance. So this idea that if God has delivered and God has blessed us and God has promised to meet with us, then as we walk with him, then we're going to rejoice in our God. We're not going to rejoice in ourselves or rejoice in this world. We rejoice in our God. And so uh, we, uh, the first time it is mentioned is in Leviticus 23 and 40. The last time that it's mentioned in the Old Testament, this word rejoice, is in Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 7. It says, And they of Ephraim shall be a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as through wine, yea, their children shall see it and be glad their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. And so the very first opportunity God speaks in reference to rejoicing is in reference to the Feast of Tabernacles. The last time it's mentioned in Zechariah chapter 10, it declares the impact of the males rejoicing in their God on their children. And oftentimes I think we forget that uh, our gladness, our happiness, our rejoicing in our God impacts our children. And I think many a child has been turned away from the Lord because of bad spirit or griping and complaining that is among believers, adult believers in the church. Uh, why is that? Because what are we showing them as being something that we should look forward to? I certainly don't want to be around people that are always grumping and, and griping and complaining about everything and say, well, this is a wonderful life I live. And I'm like, where? Where are you living in? Now, because I don't see it. But then when you get around people and you, you see they're rejoicing in the Lord, there is great glory that is experienced because of their happiness, it stirs your heart to rejoice also. Amen. You know, it's it's always, I don't know, it's always easy to say amen in a church where people are saying amen. But if nobody's saying amen, and you say amen, then you're singled out. Uh, it, it's, it's always joyful to sing songs of praise to God when everybody in church is singing together. But when you're just singing by yourself, uh, it's like, oh man, I didn't hit, hit that tune right. And uh, so the rejoicing, the rejoicing make, brings about great glory because of the fact our rejoicing impacts those that are around us. And so uh, we see that this, you go a little bit farther here. Uh, and we see the matter of rejoicing in the New Testament. Rejoice. It's used 41 times in the New Testament. The first time this word rejoice is used is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12. And it is in reference to persecution. But in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12 it says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so once again, it's carrying this concept that as a believer, a follower of our God, then there is rejoicing that makes us exceedingly, abundantly glad and happy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances are in our life, what we're going through, what is happening around us, because our rejoicing is not based on the circumstances in life. Our rejoicing is based on our God. Okay. And so we rejoice and be exceedingly glad. The last time that this word rejoice is used in the Bible, in the, in the New Testament, 
is in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And so knowing that the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, the church is going to be in the presence of our God, then, then we're looking forward to a time of rejoicing and happiness and celebration because of being united together with our Savior. And so a righteous man, righteous when righteous men do rejoice. When men are doing what is right and they're rejoicing in the Lord, then he says there's great glory. Now, this great glory is kind of an interesting word also. The word glory means to have beauty or to have splendor or honor. And uh, we, we often talk about glorying in Christ. That means he receives all the beauty and all the splendor, all the honor, all the acknowledgement, all the accolades that we can express is placed upon Jesus Christ. And uh, that takes place when righteous men are rejoicing. There is great glory. There is great acknowledgement. It's, in other words, it's hard to defame the name of our God when we're rejoicing. It just, it's not compatible. It doesn't go along with each other. And so when we rejoice, it's a natural thing that God is going to be glorified. Why? Because you're not going to rejoice if you're not being righteous. And if we're being righteous, then we'll have a spirit of rejoicing and gladness. And that rejoicing and gladness brings glory to our God. He's exalted. He's lauded because of who he is. <laughs> this word glory is used 157 times in the New Testament. I'm going to test you next week to see if you remember these numbers. <laughs> well, the word glory is used 214 times. In the Old Testament, in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 24 through 27, I think I put that on there. I did this. Yes. Says, declare His glory. Uh, it's just interesting how the, it, the Bible is telling us to do what is right, to rejoice, so there'll be glory. But the reality is, you need to declare, to show for, speak for, testify the fact of the glory of God. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among the nations, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens glory and honor in his presence, strength and gladness are in his place. And so when we rejoice, we do what it's right, we rejoice, there is glory that is declared or pronounced on our Savior and our God. C.S. Lewis said this, Joy is the serious business of heaven. I think some old grumps, uh, when they get to heaven, are going to get shook up because the focus of heaven is rejoicing. Amen. The focus of heaven is not complaining, and it certainly is not griping, and it certainly is not being sad, and it certainly is not uh, being burdensome to one towards another. The serious business of heaven is rejoicing. Right. And so it's okay to practice a little bit down here. <laughs> C.S. Lewis goes on to say this, we must play... He's continuing his thought here. Joy is a serious business of heaven. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind. What kind? The joy that's in heaven. That's our merriment. Our merriment is not trying to enjoy everything that the world is doing. Because everything the world is doing is corrupt and defiling to mankind. But our merriment is based on the fact that in heaven there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And he goes on and says, it is in fact the merriest kind. There's something wrong when Christianity finds the best kind of rejoicing or entertainment or merriment not in the things of heaven. But we find them in the things of the earth. 
He goes on to say, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No um, uh, flippancy, no superiority, and no presumption. Why? Because we acknowledge the fact that a righteous man, a man who is doing right, right, will rejoice. And when he rejoices, there will be glory declared upon our God who has given us this life that we enjoy. And so, great glory. Let's think of a few things here tonight. Great glory. First of all, need to rejoice in the God of uh, the salvation of God. I'm sorry. Rejoice in the salvation of God. Don't ever get over the salvation of God. Luke chapter 10 and verse 20 says, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. Amen. I, I believe the Lord has put much emphasis on the fact that our rejoicing is the fact that we are going to heaven. Amen. Not because I was able to accomplish a lot on this earth. I'm afraid so many times that we're so focused on getting rewards in heaven that we forget the, ma the magnificent reward in heaven is being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because what we do is we get so focused on the rewards in heaven that we become prideful in our work here on the earth and it becomes a gnaw. So we need to rejoice in the salvation of God. Uh, the longer you're saved, the happier you ought to be as a Christian. Uh, the longer you're saved, the more joyful spirit you ought to have about worshiping and praising and serving our God. Why? Because we, we must rejoice in the salvation of God. Why? Because it's offered to all. I'm glad that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. I'm glad that he didn't stop saving people in 1978. Because I wouldn't be saved. God didn't get saved until 1979. I'm glad that God can save us and save anyone because of the fact he offered salvation to all and that everyone receives salvation the same way they receive it by his grace. You say, this is elementary for me. I know it's elementary, but we need to get happy in the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need to rejoice in the goodness of our God that he would save a wretch like me. Amen. And you. <laughs> Received by the grace of God. I'm glad we can't work. We can't pay our way. We can't try to manipulate circumstances in our life. Because too many people are smarter than me. Too many people have more money than I do. Two people are far more talented than I am. And so I would never make it to heaven on those issues and those circumstances. But I can make it to heaven by God's grace. Amen. So it was offered to all, received by grace, and it's secured for all eternity. When he saved you, you're saved, saved, saved. There's never a time when you're not saved, saved, saved. So you always have something to rejoice in. If you don't have anything else in this life, you can rejoice in the salvation of God. And so you can do what's right, you can live what is right, and you can rejoice in the fact that God saved you, and now you've declared the glory of God. I like what Billy Graham said. I don't know. Did I put this on there? I didn't put it on? No, all right. Listen up. This is what Billy Graham said. Salvation is always good news. I like that. I always like to get good news. You don't get much good news on the news networks, that's for sure. Salvation is always good news. Why? And he says this. It is news of God's love and forgiveness. Amen. You can't talk about the salvation of God without talking about God's love and God's forgiveness. It's always good news. Why? Because it's about being adopted into the family of God. You know, we have all kinds of dysfunctional situations in this world that we live in when it comes to family relationships. But I want to tell you one relationship that is sweet 
that overcomes all the functionality in the world that we live with in when they talk about the family and home life and relationships. And that's the fact that God's salvation is good news because he adopted me into the family of God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. It's good news because of the fellowship that we have with his people. Amen. And uh, we, we are able to enjoy sweet fellowship. It's a good news because of the freedom from the penalty of sin. I'm glad I don't have to pay for my sin. I'm glad it's already been paid for. And it's good news because of the liberation from the power of sin in your life. And so we have something to reach on, say. Just, just live your life as a righteous man. And as you live your life as a righteous man, you're going to rejoice. And as you rejoice, you're going to be declaring the glory of God. So rejoice in the salvation of God. You can rejoice in the power of God. Rejoice in the power of God. Psalm 97 and 1 says, The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. And so knowing this, we can rejoice in the power of God because it is the Lord who reigns. The problem in the world that we live in is everybody's trying to figure out how to be able to have the power to reign. And so they oppress each other. But the reality is we surrender to the reality of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on this earth. Psalm 58 and verse 10 says, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Rejoicing because our Savior is the King and he is in control of all things, and he has the power to rule in the reign. And so no matter what is going on, does not mean that Jesus' hands are tied and he can't change the circumstances Amen. in life. So rejoice in the power of God. There's power to save. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm, we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? It's the power of God unto salvation. Uh, God can still have the power to move to change people's lives. And he can change your life. He can change other people's lives. And so you can rejoice in that. Uh, there is a power to be a witness. Acts 1.8 says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. So we can rejoice that there's power to save. There, we can rejoice... That there's power to be a witness. And, and listen, tonight, if there's somebody you love and you care for that is not saved, don't give up on them. Amen. Continue to rejoice that God is strong enough to save their soul. Amen. Why? Because he has given you the power to be able to be a witness to them. So rejoice in the power of God. Power not only to save and to witness, but a power over the enemy. The devil can't stand against the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, the world is already a defeated foe. Satan is a defeated foe. The demons do not have power to overwhelm you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So rejoice. Power to live. Ephesians 1, Paul talks about us being able to have the power of God to live our Christian life. Uh, years ago, I heard this guy giving a testimony, and he was like, oh, the Christian life is so hard. Oh, the Christian life is, is too overwhelming. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. If Jesus Christ is on the throne of your heart, then you have the power to live your Christian life. Yes. God would not say a righteous man does rejoice and then there is great glory if he did not give us the power to do so. I believe that God gives us the power to live our life. And there is the power of the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Don't sell the word of God short. Give people the word of God. That's what is going to impact them. Your opinion is not going to impact them. But the word of God will impact them. And so rejoice in the salvation of God. Rejoice in the power of God. D.L. Moody said this. If God is your partner, make your plans big. 
I like that. And uh, I tell you, I've just been praying about what, Lord, what is it that we need to do? And uh, I'll tell you, I still have big plans for the church ministry here. I still have big plans for my own life. I still have big plans because I believe that God wants to do some magnificent things in us and through us. And so let's have the faith to believe, to rejoice in the power of God to do the things that we cannot do. God can do abundantly beyond what you can think of. Amen. Hudson Taylor said this, there are three stages in the work of God, impossible, difficult, and done. I like that. A.B. Simpson said this, All that God requires of us is an opportunity to show what He can do. <laughs> we're, we're always trying to show God what we can do. You can't do anything. Amen. Amen. You can't get out of your bed in the morning if it wasn't for God giving you the strength to get up. Amen. You couldn't sit here and say, Amen! Amen. If it wasn't God giving you the breath and the power in your diaphragm to push it out. Hey! I'll tell you, I feel good. What am I saying? A righteous man, a person who is doing what is right, will rejoice and bring glory to God because he rejoices in the salvation of God and he rejoices in the power of God. But he also rejoices in the holiness of God. Psalm 97 and 12 says, Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous. Oh, that word righteous keeps coming up. Rejo rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. And uh, we worship God in holiness. Back in Psalm 99, uh, speaks in reference to the fact of worshiping God in his holiness. And uh, we, we in, uh, in Christianity have developed the mindset that we must create an atmosphere that we then identify as worship. But in Psalm 99, in uh, verse 9, it says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship him at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. So we rejoice in the holiness of God. We, 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 listen, we cannot expect to enjoy worship when we have a preconceived idea about what worship is apart from acknowledging the holiness of God. Because if you're trying to create an atmosphere of worship and you deny the reality of the holiness of God, that there is none like our God. Amen. That he is above all things of this earth. And that he is the one who is absolutely holy and not tempted. And not desiring to corrupt mankind. And you come in and worship in him without that concept. You are creating your own concept of worship that defies and rejects the holiness of God. And so we need to rejoice in the holiness of God. I'm glad I have a holy God. Amen. I tell you, you see different people, I see different Christians following the immoral relationships and fall by the wayside. And I think, praise God, I'm glad I wasn't underneath of their leadership. You see the world get so corrupt and so apart from God and you look at that and you think, Man, I'm glad that my God is not manipulated by this world. I'm glad my God is greater and bigger and stronger and more powerful and more righteous and more holy than anything that is in this world. And as I worship Him, I want to have a spirit of worshiping and holiness because He is holy. How in the world can I come into His presence? How in the world can I declare His glory if I'm not coming with in the realm of the holiness of God? Amen. We worship in holiness. There's victory in holiness. Psalm 106. Psalm 106 in verse 47. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen 
to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. See, there's victory in praising God. So if we are righteous and we are pursuing the Lord to rejoice and celebrate who he is, then it is a natural thing that we are able to be victorious in our life as we lift up his holiness. So rejoice in the holiness of God. Worship in holiness, victory in holiness. There's hope in holiness. Over in Romans chapter 5, in verse 5, and the Apostle Paul speaks about the holiness of God and the relationship of the believer with his God. If I get over there real quick, I'll read it for you. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So our hope that we have is based upon the presence of the Holy Spirit that is in us. He brings to us and embeds in us the holiness of God. And then there's a lid, and we live in holiness. In Romans 12, 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself your bodies a living sacrifice which is holy he tells us holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and that throws us right back to our text verse a righteous righteous men do rejoice and bring forth the glory of God and with great glory Charles I should say not Charles J.C. Riley said this holiness and I thought this was a good explanation of this. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God. Let me read that again. A little short sentence, but it is deep and theological thought of what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to rejoice. He says, holiness is the habit there's a lot of things that you do in your life, you do by habit. Now, I remember before I got saved, drove tractor and trailer, I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. I'd get in my truck, I'd light up a cigarette. When I'm back in the truck into the dock, I lit up a cigarette. When I was getting ready to pull out of the dock, I lit up, I lit up a cigarette. I'd have a cup of coffee, I'd light up a cigarette. Why? Did I feel like I needed that cigarette? No, it was a habit. It was how I lived my life. <clears throat> the reality is holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God. So you don't question God. You surrender your thoughts to Amen. our God. Amen. He goes on and says, according as we find his mind described in Scripture. So in other words, we don't make up a new mind of God to fit into the culture and we live in. We develop a one-mindedness with the mind and the heart of God based on what the scriptures describe the mind of God as being. Jesus said, let, I mean, the apostle Paul said, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. It's habitually living your life thinking the way that God thinks according to what his word has been revealed to you so you have a grasp on his mind. It is the habit of agreeing in God's judgment. Hating what he hates. Loving what he loves. And measuring everything in the world by the standard of his word. You say, well, why would I do that? Because you want to rejoice in the holiness of God. And the way you rejoice in the holiness of God, you do what is right. And that brings rejoicing. And then you experience the great glory of our Savior. Andrew Murray said this. Nowhere can we get to know the holiness of God and come under his influence and power except in the inner chamber. It has been well said, no man can expect to make progress in holiness who is not often and long alone with God. You have got to 
spend more time with God than in front of the computer screen. You have got to spend more time with God than your texting and your social media interaction. You have got to spend more time with God uh, apart from your entertainment so as to gain the knowledge of who God is. You say, well, why would I do that? Because the righteous men do rejoice. And there's great glory in their rejoicing. Then C.S. Lewis said this. A man can no more diminish God's glory. And that's what we're talking about. Righteous, rejoicing, God's glory. C.S. Lewis said a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him then a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling darkness on the wall of his cell. <laughs> what, what are we saying? The great glory of God. The great glory of God is experienced when righteous men rejoice. And when they rejoice, there is great glory. And that rejoicing can come about by rejoicing in the salvation of God and in the power of God and the holiness of God. And we can impact the world that we live in because the glory of God will be declared. And so I want to challenge you tonight just to think about your relationship with our God and you think about all that the Bible reveals of what God has to say and what he desires of us and then you say, well, wait a minute, let me evaluate and assess. Am I really happy in the Lord, or am I just putting on a facade? <laughs> Is God really generating in my mind, in my heart, the thoughts of His glory? Or am I just trying to put on a show when I come in the church and nobody will think I'm back soon? Serious business, folks. Serious business. And so we can rejoice in the Lord. You say, well, how can I do that? Well, just start doing what's right. Be righteous. Just start doing what's right. You'll get happy in the Lord. You'll get excited with Christ. And then you'll be able to start lifting up the name of our God and bringing great glory to Him. That's right. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for this thoughts here tonight about great glory. Uh, help us, Lord, to know your mind, know your heart, so that we might be able to do what is right and just and good, uh, so that we might be happy in our God. And Lord, help us. Help us never to move away from rejoicing in the salvation of God and the power of God and the holiness of May these three thoughts, Lord, just permeate everything that we are when it comes to worship and praise. That the glory of God might be declared. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing the song. All to Jesus I surrender. If you need to come and pray tonight, you come as God will lead you. And I just know this. God can get you happy in Him. If we just do what's right and rejoice and have great glory. Amen, Pastor Mark.
you so much. Lord, we have so much to rejoice in. We have so much to be thankful for. I would just pray, Lord, that as we leave here this evening, Lord, that we would be reminded of, Lord, just who you are. And that we would leave here rejoicing in who you are, in your holiness, Lord, in your power. And Lord, that others would see the joy on our face and know, Lord, that there is something different. Lord, may we be a witness and a testimony of the love of God, not only through our words, but through our lives, that others may see a difference in us, that others may see Christ in us. And Lord, give us opportunities this week, Lord. Open doors for us, Lord, to share the gospel message with others, that they too can have that joy in their heart, and that they too, Lord, would just put forth the glory of God Lord, we thank you for all we've heard. Lord, we thank you for your message this evening. We pray, Lord, you would bless us now with your, uh, dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.